Our New Testament reading and preaching text can be found in Matthew chapter 16, verses 13 through 20. When we get all back uh, to uh, our normal gathering worship style, please make sure you take time to thank our choir. They have been doing a yeoman's job of carrying us through this time. And they would love to be way more than just four of us. But uh, there are, you have done a great job with caring for us during this time, with ushering us into worship, with helping the message go into our hearts and not just exist in our minds. Thank you so very much. Matthew 16, 13 through 20. Now when Jesus came into the district of Caesarea Philippi, he asked his disciples, Who do people say that the Son of Man is? And they said, Some say John the Baptist, but others Elijah, and still others Jeremiah or one of the prophets. He said to them, But who do you say that I am? Simon Peter answered, You are the Messiah, the Son of the living God. And Jesus answered him, Blessed are you, Simon, son of Jonah, for flesh and blood has not revealed this to you, but my Father in heaven. And I tell you, you are Peter, and on this rock I will build my church, and the gates of Hades will not prevail against it. I will give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven, and whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven, and whatever you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. Then he sternly ordered the disciples not to tell anyone that he was the Messiah. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. There were a lot of messiahs running around in Jesus' day. Or maybe I should say a lot of people running around claiming to be messiahs. These men would claim that they were the one that Israel was waiting for. That if Israel would only rally behind them, that they would deliver the victory over the enemies that Israel was looking forward to. The victory over their own authorities and maybe even Rome. But to make this claim back in Jesus' day had gotten to the point that it was understood as an act of rebellion. To claim you were the Messiah got looks from King Herod and maybe even looks from Rome. In our story today, Jesus takes the disciples off the beaten path way up north into Caesarea Philippi, away from everything where you can say things, even treasonous things, without, without being heard by those who may take offense. And as Jesus so often does, he begins with a question. He asks his friends, those that are the closest to him. What's the word on the street? Who are people saying that I am? I love asking little kids questions that they care about. So often we miss it. We ask them questions that they don't care about, and they either don't respond or they barely respond back. But in those sweet moments where you really ask them a good question, they ponder all kinds of stuff. They st say stuff related to the question. They say other things that just happen to be on their minds. Lots and lots of information rolls out. And Jesus' disciples seem to respond that way, like they have been pumped up with this feeling, this conversation about who Jesus is, the speculation. And they respond, John the Baptist, Elijah, Jeremiah, or one of the other prophets. The theologian N.T. Wright points out that this tells us a lot about what Jesus, how Jesus is being understood and what he's about. Jesus isn't this just goody-goody, this Mr. Rogers with a beard who always says the nice thing. Jesus is like the powerful prophets in Israel's history who stood up to kings and the people when they did not want to hear the word of God and boldly spoke it, often at great expense. There is probably nothing that is more damaging to our faith than thinking of Jesus as too tame or subdued. 
when we do that, his message becomes antiquated, out of touch. That's not the words of Jesus. Jesus' words put every nation in the history of the world on notice. You're not living up to who you're supposed to be. You're not doing what you're supposed to be doing. And as we engage the words of Jesus, even today, we become aware of that. But Jesus doesn't stop at who others thought he was. He wants to know who the disciples thought he was. What do his friends think about him? And so, if you know much about Jesus, and if you've read the Gospels before, you're not surprised that Peter, the one who seems to rush into everything, the one who leaps and then thinks, who speaks and then thinks about what came out of his mouth, he is the one that speaks the quickest. And he says, you are the Messiah, the Son of the living God. An excellent response. And Jesus commends Peter and talks to Peter about how God is going to use him as he builds his kingdom and builds the church around the world. Simon has broken free from the conjecture on the street. He hasn't limited Jesus to just a role that uh, has happened before. He is seeing Jesus in a new way. Obviously, Peter has been with Jesus. He's learned from Jesus' words. He's learned from his example. And Jesus congratulates him for coming to such a good position. But the question for us is, what do his words mean? And what do they not mean? And what do we need to consider as we lean into understanding Jesus as the Messiah, the Son of the living God? This period of time, as I said before, is filled with people who are claiming to be the Messiah and people who are looking for the real Messiah. And as they understood the Messiah, it was going to be a, a military leader who came and finally broke Israel free from their enemies and oppressors. The interest in this is probably spurred on at this time because Israel is under the authority of Rome. And as a people who define themselves so, so at their core as the people that God led out of slavery in Egypt, anybody being over them feels like Egypt again, and they're not up for it. Peter's proclamation gets the title of Jesus correct, but it is locked in a naive understanding of what the Messiah is called to do. This Messiah is so much more and will do so much more than the limited understanding that Peter and many others have. They are, it's an understanding that attempts to lock Jesus in a certain path and position. Peter also refers to Jesus as the Son of the living God, and we need to unpack that as well. In no way does Peter at this time understand Jesus as the second member of the Trinity, as God in human form. After Jesus' resurrection, the disciples are going to look back on this and understand how much more was in that understanding. But at this time, they understand it um, being more in line with what uh, God is doing. Peter sees this as meaning Jesus has a special relationship with God, called and used by God as the former kings of Israel were used by God. Right says Peter is saying, Jesus, you are our true king. You're the one Israel has been waiting for. You are God's adopted son, the one of whom the Psalms and prophets had spoken. But see, Peter is still aiming way too low at who Jesus is. As I studied this this week, I was really encouraged by this interaction. You know why? Because I aim too low about who Jesus is too. Do you? I've had the benefit of living after the resurrection when Jesus revealed more of who he was. 
I live about 2,000 years since Jesus walked the earth. I've had the benefit of thousands of years of the church trying to grasp who Jesus is, and I've spent most of my life trying to understand that as well. And even though I've graduated from seminary and work vocationally in the church, I'm right there with Peter, shooting far too low. And while we listen to Peter's declaration, we have to realize we always need to grow in our understanding of who Jesus is and what this means to us. Now, on the one hand, it's sort of simple. He's the Messiah. He's the Son of the living God. But on the other hand, this is a statement that we will never fully comprehend. But it's one we need to try to comprehend. For Peter and the other disciples saying this, it sets a dangerous tone. It claims commitment to someone that isn't the king of Israel and isn't the emperor of Rome. And for us, although they aren't, you know, we don't deal with that today. We don't face these problems like they did in Jesus' day. Saying this has all kinds of consequences for us as well. Many in our congregation grew up in a time when society almost forced you to go to church. To miss a church session or a few uh, weeks of church, your boss might say something at work. Hey, I've noticed you haven't been around at church for a while. What's going on? It could have repercussions on your career. But when, in a company meeting, you might ask if a proposal was moral, the same boss might call you into his office later and say, stop bringing Sunday into Monday. Meaning, you don't bring your faith into your vocation. You need your career and your church life to be separate. And when it benefits the business, you ignore the other benefit, beliefs. We don't get that kind of pressure today. A lot of people are on the golf course on Sunday mornings and don't think twice about being in the church and they don't catch any heat from anybody about it. But in other ways, we can catch heat. In many places we exist, people demand that we believe and live the way they do about any number of political interpretations of faith. And often, whether they are conservative positions or progressive They aren't in line with the understanding of who Jesus really is, our true king. If you add any other label to Jesus, it won't fit. God plus anything is heresy. See, Peter struggles with what we all struggle with, trying to make Jesus fit in our understanding of him instead of trying to be influenced by who Jesus really is. Peter thought, so this guy is the Messiah. That's got to be good for me. That's got to be good for my country. That's got to be good for my world. But who Jesus is is so much bigger than that. You see, following Jesus doesn't make life easier. Following Jesus will regularly put us in situations where our views have to be modified to stay in line with his. When Jesus' views on things rarely challenge us or change us, we either aren't understanding Jesus well, or we are hijacking his voice with our own. Because there is no ideology that always lines up with his. But the hope in this text rings true with the love of God and the encouragement that Jesus pours out on Peter. Peter's view is not clean. It isn't even close to who Jesus is. But God doesn't ever demand that we have him all figured out. This nice next step for Peter is noticed by Jesus and praised by Jesus. But it makes us question so many parts of our own views about God. Is the God we understand really the ultimate power in our lives, or have we settled for a God who is too tame? 
In C.S. Lewis's book, The Lion, the Witch, and the Wardrobe, he talks about this understanding of God being dangerous, uh, this understanding of God never being too tame. In this book, the Christ character is a great lion. And when the children are told that they're going to go to see the lion, they get nervous. And one of them says, is it a tame lion? And the person they're responding to says, Aslan, the lion, tame? No, he's not tame at all. But he's good. The goodness of who Jesus is comes through in our text today. And it comes through to our frayed understanding of who he is. And his love for us pours out on us as well. But because he loves us, he wants so much more for us. He doesn't want us to settle for a view of him that isn't consistent with who he is or what he is about. When we are stagnant in knowing and following Jesus, we are settling for so much less than Jesus wants for us. But when we unwrap more and more about God, there is benefit and benefit and benefit that pours out. And even though we will never have it worked, all worked out, Jesus celebrates us as well. Earlier I said, if you have too safe of a picture of Jesus, that is dangerous. It's also dangerous if your picture of him is too authoritative, something like a mean judge. If you view God in this way, you will never see a God who celebrates and you won't celebrate either. You'll spend your life trying to measure up, which you never will, and you will never feel what it means to have your God love you despite yourself. The picture we have to, of Jesus today is of a God who really loves us, who wants us to grow in knowing him, his essence, his character, his nature, so we can experience more and more of who he is. Jesus is neither a tyrant, nor is he a God that is okay with whatever we think. He wants our knowledge and understanding of him to grow so that we can grow. This growing understanding of Jesus will never end. We are going to spend eternity in a place where heaven and earth connect and unite. And one of our greatest, most worthwhile activities will be getting to know God for eternity. A task that will never end. So what is our call today? It's to take time to know God more. To pray, to seriously pray. And read the Bible and take its words seriously. I think it's also be really great for us to challenge ourselves with a book about God that is more of a stretch than we're used to. Some of us need to be stretched more intellectually. We need to be pushed a little in that way. Some of us are drawn to intellectual pursuits, and maybe we need to do something that stretches our heartstrings more, helps us understand that side of who God is and who we are as well. As we do this, see if God doesn't meet you in it to show you in a deeper, more meaningful way who he is and what he is about. God wants more for us, not more from us. See if he doesn't lavish praises over you as you press into knowing him. Let us pray. Even from a place of exile, from a position of despair, we trust, O oh God, in your power to return and restore us, to enliven and empower us, to soothe and save us. You can turn a desert into Eden, sorrow into joy, and silence into singing. The heavens may vanish above and the earth dissolve underneath, but your salvation is forever. We wait for you, O oh God, attentive and hopeful, for with you, deliverance is always possible. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Join us at First Presbyterian Church every Sunday on our website or 
Watch us on My 11, Sunday mornings at 9.